Welcome to the Endo meeting. Uh, today, I'm going to give a demo of what I'm up to with this new pull request for what I'm calling a Endo pet daemon. This is the idea is that there's an Endo daemon that is an executor for arbitrary ap applications on behalf of the user. One of the requirements for this in order for it to be interesting is one, it has to work on Windows. Two. <laughs> um, and uh, two, it has to uh, it has to be able to do some form of persistence while still being ephemeral at its bootstrap layering. Um, there there is a notion that this will be able to run swing sets, but swing sets are um, more than we need in order to have a suitable platform for snaps that are running um, that are running on behalf of the user outside of a browser in order to get away from the manifest v3 limitations on its execution model. Um, and then also this uh, this would provide a foundation for um, being able to put a plug in uh, a, perm a highly an, an unsafe plug in that would allow you to connect safe applications to the agoric chain um, ideally and then um, and then also be able to do peer-to-peer -peer connections and such. Um, so it, the idea is to run as quickly as possible to the long-term version for a decentralized execution model on behalf of user agents. Um, so how do we get there? Uh, problem number one was to have ephemeral workers out of which uh, persisted workers could be made. So, um, so it needed to be possible to be able to refer to have essentially a sturdy reference to a thing that uh, that can be recreated from base principles next time uh, next time you reboot your computer or restart the endo daemon. So let me uh, let me show you what I can do right now uh, bin endo. Okay, so bin endo is like Docker, but for confined JavaScript applications um, at this particular layer. So what we're talking about doing is saying things like, hey, endo bin, Let's start a, a supervisor process. Then endo start a supervisor process. And you'll note that over here in your home directory somewhere, and somewhere depends on what platform you're on and whether you have the right environment variables for overriding it. It's, it's all, suffice it to say, it puts it where you want it. And if you're on a Mac, there's a place where it's supposed to go. If you're on Windows, there's a place where it's supposed to go. If you're on Linux, there's a place where it's supposed to go. But also a, um, a set of environment variables that all begin with XDG, standing for cross-platform or cross-desktop something, um, that this thing respects. Um, and so what you'll note over here is that when you start, you're going to get an endo directory that contains an endo log, which is the out log output of the daemon itself, and a captp 0sock That's the Unix domain socket, which is listening for net string delimited captp messages. Um, in the version of the captp protocol, I'm provisionally calling zero in expectation that there will be other versions and maybe an OCAP and, and so on and so forth in the future. Um, and uh, and the endo daemon would conceivably listen on all of these uh and and thereby have a a forward and backward compatibility story um this is also uh, and to be clear this is the this is a rendezvous point the endo daemon is listening on this and accepting connections from you the user and only you you the user because this is in your home directory in a protected location um and uh which is to say that other applications on your system will, can use this to communicate with the endo daemon. Notably, the command line interface is going to establish connections to this endo sock and then communicate with it, much in the way that you can you communicate with Docker's uh, supervisor, uh, which also uses a Unix domain socket or a named pipe on Windows. This works with named pipes as well. Um, the, the, the whole story here uh, to connect the docs to a graphical user interface, there are two different stories we're pursuing, one of which is the web browser reaches out with an extension using native message host, uh, a native message host with it, which would establish a connection from either a web page or an extension to the endo daemon, in which case it would be able to retrieve a facet 
on behalf of that web page that it would be able to grant some limited authority to a web page, for example, the ability to request any of the things that a worker can request. Um, and then also uh, a graphical user interface, which is what I why I was exploring Socket Supply Co. for the last uh, well, a couple of weeks before this week. Um, or an Electron app, which we've previous, previously pursued. Last year, I put together a demo of connecting the dots for um, for an Electron app. And so there, there's a direction there that we need to follow through on. In any case, I am doing all of this demo using the command line unit, a command line user interface as a point to start. Um, so things that you can do with Endo currently include store, um, in which case you can say, I want to store Endo's README, um, and I'm going to store it with the name. I'm going to give it a pet name, Endo README. Uh huh. Okay. All right. So it's broken. Good to know. We're just going to quit fix this really quick. <clears throat> All right, now we're going to store a readme. Okay, oh. okay. Wait, wait, wait. Um, I'm sorry, did you do the store already? Uh, no. no, read me. Now I've done the store. <laughs> okay, so, so, so right here, um, I would like to understand what you, what's, where the state is. Mm -hmm. That is why this is a two terminal <laughs> demonstration. Over here in the second oven, <laughs> you will note that the store command has had some side effects on our storage in your home directory. One of which is to create an endo readme pet name. And the other of which is to store the content of that file under its SHA-512 in a content address store. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, I think so. Let me, let me ask some, so the, so the thing that you've given a name to is data, which can be, which can have a hash and mm -hmm. the pet name, um, the pet name table that you've stored it in is just stored as data in this data file in your home directory. And because it's in the home directory in a fixed place, uh, there's only one uh, root pet name, um, root pet name namespace per user. Correct. Yeah, okay. the pet name namespace is per endo user. Okay. So we've really, we've taken the notion, the operating system's notion of user, and we're, we're making, we're, we're recognizing that as a very first class notion in this. Yes. Uh, in order for a person to have multiple independent pet namespaces, uh, they would need to use the operating system to create multiple operating system users. Um, that's one, that is certainly one possibility. It's also possible, though not implemented, to, um, so the problem is rendezvous, right? Um, how do multiple applications rendezvous at a Unix domain socket and the corresponding state for a particular entity? What's the, it is certainly possible for a user to have more than one, but there's only going to be one that all multiple applications can rendezvous at from first. Can principle. I object to the to the thing we do at all of work meetings, which is go to the most complicated scenario before we go to the simple one? <laughs> can I see the rest of the demo before we dive down this rabbit hole? Okay. <laughs> all right. So suffice it to say, on top of this user, there is a there is this user gets one pet name, uh, what one pet name database, and in that pet name database, names are references to other persistent things. And if you overwrite the name, the other thing can remain and can be retained by other means. So pet name. So the name is the name is not the thing that it refers to. It's a reference to it. Um, 
such that if a pet name is reused later, it overwrites the reference, but other things may still refer to the other to to this by its hash, for example, or a worker, which I will show next, um, based off of its UUID. Um, so let's is, is the is the pet name uh, table is the pet name space used in a bidirectional manner? Um, by bidirectional, do you, mean, do you mean can you look up the name for a reference? Right. If somebody if if somebody introduces me to the designated object, uh, is there a user agent that re that renders that to me in terms of my pet name for the designated object? That is intended to exist within the design, and I have stuff on my working copy toward that end because it's necessary for the next step. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the intention is, to be, is for there, it to be possible to look up my name for a given reference. Um, so I've stored a thing. Uh, that means that I can now refer to that thing in the future, like catting it out or showing uh, what its representation in JavaScript is. Endo readme in this case is a readable file with an with a SHA, right? Um, which is to say that if you were to get this object uh, in in JavaScript, it would be represented as a as a as a far reference to a readable, and then you could you get stream or bytes or whatever from it, um, much like uh, much like response objects in the Web's file system API or Fetch API. Um, the, so that's that's files. I'm going to spawn a worker, and I'm going to call it worker. And over on the left, in the you will see that uh, there's a new pet name for the worker, and a new UUID for the worker with the output of its log, which will allow us to debug it, and the PID, which will allow us to kill it in the event that Endo dies without grace. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so the next step is doing something interesting with a worker. I can eval the number 10, uh, eval in worker. So this is like there um, in, the, in the promise notation, uh, the number 10 or the string 10, whatever. Um, that's going to produce for me the number 10. That's not interesting. Let's give it a name. Okay, so now I have uh, a pet name called 10 and a value UUID, which corresponds to how did I make the number 10 such that if I were to say restart endo, I now have a new endo in which the worker is not running. Um, I can say, show me 10 and it'll reconstruct the value um, on demand. And the way it does that is by going into the endo value UUID, and it says, "Hey, I'm this is a node type of a node of type eval, which is to say you can reconstruct the value by evaluating at this source on the worker with this UUID with these endowments. In this case, there are none. Um, what this means is that uh, in order to evaluate this, I'm going to have to go look up that worker UUID and reconstruct it." Um, and, uh, and thereby have a place in which to execute it. What is the UUID? The UUID is a randomly generated number that corresponds to a path, a node along the derivation path to a particular value. It's a UUID in order to have something the pet name can refer to that, um, that's in a sufficiently broad namespace that it could be used as a basis for a web key. My, my intention is to replace UUID with something with enough entropy that could be used as a web key. Okay, right. it's, it's, it's intended to have the properties of a web key. Yes. Okay. Um, so I can then say eval, again, in worker, I'm gonna say 10 plus 10, which means that I need to be endowed with the value of, num of, of 10. And that's what this argument is. And then I'm going to call that 20, right? So uh, find endo, find endo. Uh, you will note that now there is a 20 
pet name, which refers to an evaluation owed of value with this value UUID. Uh, the end, uh, yank. So if I go over to value IDs and search for that, it's this one, which is to say, off in this worker, evaluate 10 plus 10. I'm going to ad hoc format this as in, in JSON. And then it says, I'm going to locally have an endowment named 10 um, of, uh, of type value UID with this value UID. So bring this into being and then evaluate this source in a compartment endowed with that value and produce a new value. That's So that's how eval works. Um, this allows us to, uh, to, join, uh, to join powers. And note that this is just uh, that 10 in this case is a number, which is not interesting, but it could just as well be um, another object. So I can do, for example, bin endo. I want to eval in worker readme. Um, and I'm going to get the eval readme is eval readme. Um, and I'm going to say readme2, endo readme2. And oh, that predictably didn't work. So it shows me for trying to do something I've never done before. Oh, okay. So, okay, so, so, so just, I'm sorry, just, I'm, I'm just not oriented enough yet. Um, the, the text that we're looking at on the left hand pane. There, mm -hmm. there are two UUIDs. Yes. The first, the, um, and a UUID is designates something. Um, uh, is the is one of these UUIDs the UUID in which this text explains what the UUID designates? Worker UUID corresponds to a file underneath the worker UUID directory, and the value UUID corresponds to a UUID underneath the value UUID a directory, which describes how to make that thing. In all cases, these identifiers, the UUIDs and SHA-512s are all ways to designate a thing of a particular kind. Okay, so the UUIDs, the, 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 the I mean, in, in, with web key, with the web key analogy, the, server serving the UUID, UUID the, the, the thing that's determining what it is that the UUID designates uh, is this same um, per user directory. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's effectively you have a, it's like you have a per user object server uh, whose storage is the, the data in this directory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or or values that can be I mean, values that can be reconstructed from the instructions in these directories. Yes. Okay. Can, can you eval something that actually has methods? Yeah, you can. Um, or at least that's what I just tried, and maybe it doesn't work yet. But oh, okay. Uh, the idea is in worker. I want if I were to say eval with, um, yeah, eval. <laughs> eval read me it's endo read me but let's just say that i'm going to get a reference and pass it back um because uh, there's nothing interesting i can do with this yet um oh that's not true i can say e um e, uh endo read me dot um dot stream for example i can do that um and then right. what about making a new object this makes a new object no, but just open curly, you know. Oh, oh, blah, 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 oh blah. yeah. Oh, gosh, that's easy. Yeah. <laughs> easy things work. Um, we're going to call this. Oh, but, okay, but instead of 10, can I put some uh, a function? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Like, like double. Yeah, okay. Check my work. Uh, let's call it double. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. That might might even work. Who knows? No, it didn't. Don't we put parentheses around it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. No. 
Oh, that was cute. <laughs> okay, so what happened? Um, we have we now have an eval node of this type, which, uh, huh? I wonder why that's dying in a fire. That's curious. Um, okay. Jq dot. Okay, so we have source with no dependencies. It's gonna. Oh, I used curly braces. No. Why did it lose the? Oh, okay, that's the wrong one. This is this is the one that didn't work. <laughs> uh, and then presumably this is the one that did. Yeah. Okay. So now we have let's jq dot that and okay. So we have a thing and this is b eight one. Okay. Uh, which means that if I go out to I just turned it into a pumpkin. Oh, this is cool. Uh, okay. Uh, double is going to be B8, uh, FB1. Okay. Well, anyhow, let's give it a shot. Maybe bin eval in worker um, double 10. And I'm going to need double and 10 as it to be endowed. And maybe this will even work. No? Okay, cool. Well, that should work. And this should print out 20. Uh, that's the idea. What about stateful objects? Uh, the idea with stateful objects is that they have to be reconstructed upon restart by replaying all of the instructions that are left in the home directory. Um, so when, when I say endo show um, pet name, if that pet name has not been revived in the current execution, it goes and visits the graph of object uh, of these value descriptions and work and and objects it goes and visits the portion of the graph that is needed in order to bring that object back into existence and then memoize it in memory so if you had given a reference to the object over to some other vat that had just sent it that you know sent it messages over cap tp mm -hmm. and the object had changed state as a result of that yes um would that would those messages be in the thing in the in the record of what needs to be replayed? This is no. This is not pro uh, producing a full transcript, and um, and the reason the reason to avoid replaying a full transcript in this cost in this case is because at this base level level, um, it needs to be possible to reconstruct workers that are able to dispatch like ephemeral requests from the web that don't get recorded. Okay. Uh, so, so, so very specifically in the scenario I just mentioned, once the object exists in a, a worker, a worker presumably is, a, is um, uh, acts like a VAT participating in CAPTP. Yes. Then while it's alive, it could receive CAPTP messages if you handed out a reference to it. Um, but then on reconstruction, all of the state change that resulted from those messages disappears. Yes, by design. Okay. Yeah, um, and that allows them to that that what that means is that restarts will remain snappy over the lifetime of a worker. It won't have to, um, it won't have to retain a, a log of everything it has ever done, um, every uh, every time it gets started. And I think that that is operationally a requirement for snaps. Um, the the idea of a snap is it's essentially you're you essentially we need to be able to start up a worker that is able to uh, to serve ephemeral requests with capabilities that were previously granted by the user possibly from a previous run of the engine um, okay. and be able to answer those questions which okay. is so that it's possible to it is possible and possibly even easy to misconfigure one of these things um, okay. but it's also easy to recover. Okay, and once, once you recreate the objects to the other VATs elsewhere that have a capability to the object that they had sent messages to, mm -hmm. do those capabilities refer to the reconstructed object or uh, are those capabilities separate? So if, uh, so to be, the intention would be um, that, so to be clear, there's no notion of a sturdy ref yet. Okay. Uh, 
and uh, and it also uh, if there if there 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 should be a notion of a sturdy ref, and it's probably going to be like uh, what Christine Lemmer Weber is proposing with edge names, right? Um, where it's uh, an essentially a link to a value in another node. So you need to be able to, it, so such a sturdy ref will need to have both um, a path to, a, a reproducible path to connect to like an IP, IP port pair, for example, um, but also possibly an IPFS or like a live P2P address, which is much more detailed um, and, and also much more portable um, or relocatable, I should say. The... Uh, based off of based off of that and um so so a link would consist of that plus the uh, the web key or part of the 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 entropy portion of the web key plus um an edge name which is to say a recommendation for the pet name uh at for whomever receives it um and uh so you would establish by whatever means a connection to my endo daemon, and then you would refer to the. Uh, uh, it, so a message being sent to me would be of the form, uh, ignoring the edge name, it would be to the web key. Um, and if that had been, if that, if the, uh, that will only be useful for things that are currently retained by that were constructed by name by the user, um, because only. You can only get a sturdy reference to something that was constructed by these means, by basically by construction from other sturdy references. So you wouldn't. So there wouldn't. No, there, there would be no notion of of reestablishing a CAPTP connection to an ephemeral object, only sturdy objects. Okay. So. The ed and the edge names, these are human readable names. The edge name would be the human readable name, yeah. Uh, which are certainly not presumed to be unguessable. So if I, so the, so, so there, so the thing that I'm holding on to doesn't have the authorizing power of a capability. Uh, the web key would, the web key would have the authorizing power of a capability. Okay, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna let you go on, but I just want to let let you know that I don't feel oriented yet. I feel like there's an explosion of questions about the layering of concepts here that I don't understand yet. Okay, well, there, uh, we can continue the conversation. There isn't a great deal of the end, uh, endo API that I have not shown you yet. Uh, I've shown you that you can say, uh, well, there's, you, you, you can figure out where, um, where endo, been endo, where state, there's these where commands that allow you to figure out where its rendezvous locations are, which will vary depending on your environment. And there's also uh, uh, bin endo reset, which would start you off from a clean slate, um, destroying this entire directory tree. And does it shut down the workers as well? Yeah, it does. Okay. And okay. then, and then bin endo uh, ping gives you a, yeah, it's sure it's running. The Unix domain socket has something listening on the other side, useful for debugging. So I've shown you spawn, show, cat, and eval. My intention is to eventually implement install out of these primitives. Um, and then allow workers to do more interesting things than evaluate things in uh, in in a compartment that only contains the desired capabilities. The code for the uh, let, let me show you the worker code. The worker has a facet that currently only has an evaluate function, and will eventually have like install bundle and uh, import unsafe node, for example. Um, and then uh, in those. In those cases, there will be a calling convention for a namespace. Like it'll have to have a main zero conventionally named method that will receive a power box. And the power box will be the communication channel back to the endo daemon um, and also be responsible for persisting 
um, some some references by name uh, so that uh, so that capabilities that were previously granted can be restored um, on the next start, but not all. Um, otherwise, it will have the power to chat with the user through the permissions user interface, for example, to ask for uh, a form or an input or uh, a choice or a pet name. So we'll be able to say, hey, I would like a reference to a thing vaguely matching this description. And then the then, then the user will be able to grant that by, by name, uh, by their name for that thing. And then it will retain it by its own name. Um, so yeah. The, that, that's literally all that a worker is doing is it's creating a read stream and a write stream on file descriptor three, creating a facet, and then a, a set, uh, start setting up a, a node net string CAPTP connection over that communication channel. That's that's the entire implementation of a worker. <laughs> and uh, so there's a lot to grow upon here. Um, and I think that that's the entirety of the demo I wanted to share today. The next step is to implement. Oh, right, and um, uh, the there is an existing archive command um, that takes an application path like foo.js and then constructs an archive. You can you can save that as foo.zip and then tar or yeah, you can open up your foo.zip and look inside of it, or save it as pet name. In which case. Now, over here, um, it has been stored and a pet name has been recovered. And so thereby, so this is the mechanism by which I intend to make it possible for a worker to, to restore a running application. The application is stored in the object store as foo.zip and then sending an install bundle message to a worker will bring it up, bring it online and give you a capable capability bearing um, uh, reference to its API. That's a, that's the demo. So um, I, do, I do sense that there's something, you know, that, that, that I mean, this is all, you know, wonderful and, and fantastic stuff that I'm partially understanding. Um, and um, I, so let me, first of all, just admit to a, a flaw so in, in myself. That, that so that you can work around it. I remember with, when I was working with Norm Hardy, if I had a complex abstract question, that the best way to understand it was to see if I could phrase it as a question about Kikos. Because if I could phrase it as a complex question about Kikos, as a you know, concrete question about Kikos, then he was able to just instantly answer it. Um, so you know, I've kind of got, have this existing model in my head about objects being in vats and there being this um, you know, distributed object graph that's um, uh, among, uh, among all of the objects in vats. Um, and then there's a disjoint partic partitioning of the objects into vats. And that this all you know, evolves with, with messages and you know, evolves in the forward direction. And, um, and that that, and, and all of that is um, just anonymous first class objects directly designating each other. And then everything having to do with human readable names, pet names and edge names and all of that and naming hubs are all built as a layer on top of that and out of that. Um, what I, and, and, and that as a starting model doesn't account for things like um, you know, persistence and upgrade and sturdy refs versus live refs and all that. I mean, those are, those, those are all things that I've, you know, understood as sort of engineering compromises needed to get as close to the abstract model as possible, despite, you know, practical concerns. Um, uh, the way, what I think I'm seeing here let me try to describe it back to you and see if I'm getting it, which is that the state associated with a user, the state associate, the state that's stored in this directory is kind of a virtual restricted VAT. Um, but 
the but it's but the but the names but the human readable name support is more fundamental and the restrictions are that it's not part of a bidirectional persistent system of objects and evolving state uh, although clearly state does evolve um, and so the so so both the so so the replay of commands for reconstructing something as opposed to the replay of messages uh, is is fundamental to the notion of the sense in which there's evolving state here um, so for so 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 am I on the right track? Is that, a, is that a way to map what you're doing into my mental model? I think so, yes. Um, and the intention is for this to serve as a foundation out of which you can build exactly your mental model as one of the types of application that can run inside of this host, right? The intention is that uh, swing set, for example, um, and the necessary databases uh, that swing set depends upon could be stored in this system such that if a worker that has been uh, that has been initialized with a swing set and the storage capabilities it needs in order to do its job would be restored from this and then be able to play full transcripts for the vats that run underneath it okay so i don't understand that yet um okay. So, so, so what do you need in order to what what you need in order to um, what you need in order to get a swing set is uh, the, the notion of a vat and a swing set is that you can replay it through, through its message history and therefore you must persist its entire message history, right? Yeah, but 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 a, another way to, to look at it, I mean, for, so first of all, that's all correct. Um, but another way to look at it is that, um, you know, from the point of view of the of the normal programmer programming this thing, it's just immortal objects whose state evolves forward over time, and that all of, all of this message replay stuff, well, that's just implementation, so that my objects never regress. Um, and likewise, we can use snapshot persistence in that model too. Um, so uh, the so the idea is the the idea is to allow for that kind of worker to exist on this platform. It's just that the transcripts is it's just that such a worker would need to be assembled based off of the cap uh, of the uh, the user granting a capability to store the transcripts and read them back, um, or the snapshots and read them back. Uh, and then, yeah, and executing XSnap workers and stuff like that. Um, so let's say hypothetically we had done everything that you have in mind. Mm -hmm. What would that? What would our interaction look like here to spawn one of those? Uh, it would look like bin endo. So you, it would. Uh, let's say it would look like endo spawn, swing set. Well, creating a worker with it. Then endo, um, endo. Uh, it, okay, wait, wait, let, let me let me stop on the first line there. Endo mm -hmm. spawn swing set. Is swing set just a pet name, or yes. is swing set recognized somehow? It's a pet name. It's just a pet name. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, at this point, I've just created one of your normal workers that's associated with the name my swing set. Yes. Okay. And then endo, uh, and then uh, store my swing set dot zip uh, with the name my swing set zip or some such, right? Okay, so now now we have the swing set code, okay, and uh, and um, or really what we want to do is uh, no, that's fine. Let's let's suppose that the zip was created a, a, a four time, but to be clear, 
archive my swing set serves index.js as um, a file my swing set zip, zip is, and then followed by store is equivalent, right? Okay, hold on. Ah, 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 ah. The endo archive command is the one that I is 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 doesn't have anything to do with this root directory state. That's just the endo archive command that I'm used to. That's the that's the that, yeah. That's the make the make archive or bundle source. In, okay, and in let me that. verify that it it runs without reference to this root directory. Yes, and this this particular form of it, yes. But to be clear, this is equivalent to these two commands. Okay. Are, are equivalent to this one command, which bypasses the local file system and writes it directly into the object store and gives it a pet name. I see. I see. Okay, that's very clarifying. I'm glad you, I'm glad you walked me through that. Okay. 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 Uh, so, so now we have some code and we have a worker in which we can run it, right? Um, so this is, this is a possible next step, right? Import bundle my swings. So I'm going to import the bundle, um, in the worker, my swing set from the thing that was stored as my swing set zip and give this the name um, my swing set API, right? Okay. So, okay. My swing set controller is probably uh, more evocative. Uh, this, would, this would create a pet name for the swing set controller object. Okay. And this would, apart from this, this would set up the code to the, the swing set code to be in a position to request the other powers that it needs from the user on demand, which would do during its initialization, which would construct the rest of the references that it needs. This is actually all that happens at the command line um, until you've got, until endo inbox, <laughs> my swing set would produce a, a list of of uh, cap requests um that you would then say grant my swing set number one as a file system something like that vaguely right uh the the idea is that um endo inbox would be the, a command line user interface for getting a list of all of the requests that were made by my swing set and then endo grant and endo deny would be ways to resolve or reject those requests um, for the user to resolve or reject, the, uh, fulfill or reject those requests. Uh, resolve is the right word. Grant would resolve um, saying, say, if my swing set request number one was for a file system object, for example, so that it could okay. transcripts, I'm going to give it the file system API designated by the file, uh, my file system as the uh or or um something like that this is all very hand wavy okay um this this is i mean this is what i needed mm -hmm. yeah and from there then then you have a swing set that has vats underneath it that would that would play back from the the transcripts that they stored in the file system um and whatever capabilities other capabilities it, capabilities it needed but it also would be in a position to ask for remote capabilities from this endo host uh, and those remote capabilities could be other ephemeral workers or um the metamask extension or um uh or a web page or uh um or a peer-to-peer -peer connection um, so one of your targets for this, and the, the reason you know why it's on this call, uh, is for snaps for for you know use by MetaMask. Um, now, 
I don't know where MetaMask keeps its state, but I would imagine that uh, you know the, the the browsers that I use have profiles, and I do use multiple profiles. I would imagine uh, MetaMask people please confirm or deny that none of the state is per operating system user, rather the state is per profile. Yeah, the browser exposes some APIs for storage, which are scoped to the profile. Okay. And the, the, the similarly, the, what kind of state does MetaMask store in this per profile state store? Um, private in encrypted private keys, um, recent transaction history, account nicknames, a phishing list, a bunch of other things. Okay, so that sounds, that's, okay, so now uh, Chris, uh, confirm or deny, that sounds like at about the same level of abstraction as what you're trying to do on a per user basis. Yes. Okay. And, and it is certainly possible for us to extend this to support profiles. Okay, okay. Okay. It comes with a certain amount of additional complexity, but it is certainly possible. Um, and actually, you know, it's already implemented. All you have to do is set your XDG environment variables to be different locations, and it'll and the state will be stored. Ah, 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 ah. Because they're environment. Okay, cool. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, and okay. I've, already, I've already coded it up such that the XDG environment variables take precedence over whatever the host conventions are. Um, okay. Yeah, so having having everything be locked in to state per user was making me very uncomfortable. This environment variable in direction, um, you know, for, for this problem, given the operating systems we're working with, uh, I'm very relieved to be able to do that. Yeah, the, the notable thing though in that case is that the environment variables that are that Chrome, for example, or a web browser in general launches under will designate which uh, which state directory that they attempt to communicate when they re with when they reach out via the XD uh, via the um, by the, the Chrome messaging host. So it might be helpful. Um it, it is likely helpful that if the messaging host could receive a profile name or profile identifier or UUID ideally um, from Chrome, that we might be able to house the house and rendezvous with state in different places depending on the, the profile of the user. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a complication we could certainly account for. Okay. Now let me let me talk about the the revival semantics and how it plays with genuine distributed objects elsewhere. Because I, I think, I, I think I understood that, and I think, and if, and I think that you're not these things. The things that that the thing that a object in a genuine remote VAT would hold to one of the objects in one of your pseudo workers would not be a unreadable CAPTP URI. It would be a, I mean, it would not be a, a you know, yeah, it would not be a CAPTP URI string. Um, uh, it would be, uh, like you said, it would, end, it would have an edge name on the end. So it would be like a capability to a naming host combined with an edge name. And that is consistent with the original object actually having disappeared. And you go, go and the naming host rebinding the edge name to a new object. So there's no object reference 
that is a reference to a stateful object that lost its memory. It's because it's not the same object reference. There is no, by putting the, by saying that you have to go indirect through the pet name, what you're saying is that the thing that you have an object reference to is only the naming hub. And from there, you get back to the stateful object um, uh, by behavior of the naming hub. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and this makes it possible to have um, this makes it possible to have a, a kind of robustness um, in the face of restarts that doesn't require all of um, all of message replay for every kind of worker. Right. It's, it's, all, it's also the case that um, it's also the case that any message leaving swing set is going to go through this. Um, uh, and it's just that the responses are going to be recorded by swing sets such, such that its its state its per its own state advances. But next time it reaches out to that object, it's just it's inherent to um, it's inherent to the problem that some of the workers are going to be persistent and remember that you they talked to you before and some are not. Um, but it's still desirable to reach out to the capability. Okay, so I'm, I, so I'm, I'm, I was assuming that this special case was only for the pseudo vats. If, if, a, if an object in a vat in one swing set under one endo uh, has a direct reference to an object in a vat in a swing set under an endo elsewhere on the network, that can be a genuine persistent capability that maintains its integrity well, to the object on the other side that maintains its memory. I believe so. Okay, without any edge names being involved. Without edge names, that's right. Okay. Yeah, the, the web key, the web key would, would be the designator. Okay, and the designator would be a genuine capability, could be, I mean, if we're assuming we solve the what do we do about unguessability in a world with public ledgers? Uh, ass assuming that problem aside for a moment, which is a big problem, um, uh, the web key would be would be understood to be a real object reference with real capability authorization properties. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. And and, and, I, and be revocable by the user. Okay. Revocable. By yeah. The user. Yeah, I haven't figured this out yet, but there does need to be a revoc revocation story, right? Uh, the layering of that is always interesting. Um, the uh, so yes, uh, you're right. the The idea is that if if you're that the uh, that you would so the I yeah 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 so some. Like by default, a web key can refer to an unrevocable capability. Okay. It, but but the idea is that that would be considered unwise, that you would derive a revocable capability out of any capability that you share with another user or even with one of your own workers. Um, so yeah, and I, I will definitely need some story for-, for So I mean- yeah, the, the, when humans share with humans, uh, pet names and pervasive revo revocability um, are, you know, as, as in the, the, you know, the Horton stuff and the stuff that, that, the, that you know, um, that, that Alan and Mark Stegler did with scoops, um, uh, that's, that's, that's good for humans interacting with humans because um, a human might, doesn't know what, revocations he might want to engage in later. When programs interact with programs, generally we don't have pervasive revocability because you can tell from the code of a program whether it ever revokes. And if there's no circumstance under which it would decide to revoke, it doesn't need the thing to be revocable. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I would put I propose that uh, the way that this gets modeled in 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 this framework would be that there would be an endo revocable command that would derive um, that would accept a pet name to refer to a thing that it, you wish to create a revocable membrane out of, um, followed by the pet name of uh, by the pet names of the new the new membrane object you're creating and the rev revocation controller. Okay, so you're talking about the things that have pet names. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you've got a swing set here talking to a swing set there, just object to object, there will be many object references that, that just happen as a result of message passing that are never given pet names. Mm -hmm. And those don't those aren't part of the revocation story that you just told because they're not part of the pet name story you just told. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Oh, perhaps they are. Um, I'm not sure. The so having a derivation node in endo storage that says create a revocable membrane out of this other object and then if you give the revocable object uh, oh the, the, cer certainly the propagation of revocability through a membrane uh, that propagates but that's distinct from being able to revoke that object individually oh right yes okay All right. Well, I hope uh, I hope this was useful to other folks on the call. Um, tell a friend. <laughs> I would have very much. I'll, I'll make sure that the recording gets posted on uh, on Agoric's YouTube. Um, okay, Chris. I think this is fantastic. I think the the lack of this kind of lightweight pseudo vat state has been an impediment and. You know, it's, I think you put your finger on what was missing in a way that I could not. I'm very glad to hear that. That's, um, that's affirming. Um, and it wasn't easy. <laughs> I've been, I've been running around uh, very uncertain how about how to make progress on this project until um, take, uh, getting some inspiration from Git and, um, and also all the other things that we hear about with durability. Um, putting two and two together uh, um, certainly made it possible to make this much progress in a relatively short amount of time. I'm looking forward to uh, making some more so that the story is more complete so that we can at least start to do real work on top of this platform. Okay, good, good. I'm excited. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'll call that a meeting and get you guys a recording as soon as possible. Thanks. Thank you.